Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the first in this series by the protest team at Garden Court Chambers, exploring protest then and now. Before we start, just a couple of quick instructions, even though I know you've all heard these so many times already. Everyone is going to be placed on mute, but we would love this to be as interactive as possible. So please do post any questions you have in the Q&A and any comments or queries that you have in, in the chat function uh, at the bottom. The webinar will be recorded. So anyone who appears on audio or video will be recorded and the video will be made available on YouTube and, and social media afterwards. Uh, the, there will be some instructions in the chat window if you're experiencing technical difficulties. So please just refer to those. So today in our webinar, we're going to explore mangrove to BLM. The Small Act series mangrove film on BBC has brought to focus the mangrove protests of 1970, which, were a demonstration, which was a demonstration against the police harassment of the mangrove restaurant in Notting Hill. And half a century of protests later, we see the most recent uprisings in June of last year. We continue today to witness overwhelming police presence at Black Lives Matter protests and police aggression against black protesters. So we're exploring today the question, what has changed from Mangrove to BLM? And we're going to start by playing a short clip. We've complained to the police about the police and nothing's been done. We've complained to magistrates about magistrates and nothing's been done. We've complained to judges about judges and nothing's been done. Now it's time to do something ourselves. That statement was made at the mangrove demonstration and represents the essence of black people's experience in Britain. That since we've come here, we've suffered a long train of abuses by the police with the active knowledge and support of the British state. And those abuses have been able to be carried out under the pretext that, quote, black people are criminals, sponsors, and prostitutes. That is a myth that has been created about us. That is a statement that was made by one police officer who gave evidence in the mangrove case. Now, the demonstration that black people made against the harassment of the mangrove restaurant, the subsequent resistance in the courts, is an active explosion of that myth. The object of the demonstration was to visit every single police station in the area. We went to Nottingdale Police Station. When we got there, there were more policemen surrounding the police station. We went to Notting Hill Police Station, by which time it had accumulated in the minds of the policemen who were on that demonstration that we had taken that issue too far. They believed, what are these cheeky West Indian niggers doing on the street challenging our authority with such confidence? They sought to break the demonstration up on Portnell Road. You had Commander Gerard, you had Commander Mags on the spot. You had numbers of inspectors, numbers of chief superintendents, and a whole host of constables lined in military formation. That is what we were presented with. It seems clearly to have been an attempt by the state to uh, prevent the growth of organized resistance within the black community, um, which had an independent leadership. Uh, and that seems to me to have been the real point of the case. And it follows a whole series of other attempts whenever black people have attempted to organize independently, um, to smash that organization before 
it got really solid, firm roots within the uh, community. 25 years of frustration exploded. In that explosion was Jonathan Jackson, what was taking place in Trinidad, the burning of the buses in Jamaica, the struggle of black people all over the world exploded on Portnell Road. I'm really pleased today to be joined by an expert panel this evening. Uh, unfortunately, Stafford Scott is no longer able to join us due to an illness and we wish him all the best, but I'm absolutely delighted that Leslie Thomas QC will be joining us to share some of his lived experiences of protests over the years. I'm sure Leslie doesn't need an introduction, but I'll give him a short one anyway. Leslie is a leading expert in claims against the police and other public authorities and claims against corporate bodies with expertise across the full spectrum of civil wrongs, civil litigation, human rights, data and privacy claims. Leslie has spent his entire career representing clients from diverse backgrounds, acting for the vulnerable, marginalised and disadvantaged who seek justice and accountability from the state and others. In June 2020, Leslie became the first black professor of law at Gresham College. His inaugural lecture series is taking place in the current academic year, examining death, the state and human rights. And in October 2020, Professor Leslie Thomas QC became a visiting professor in, in law at Goldsmith. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you for that very warm introduction. And, um, you know, I'm just um, you, ever so um, pleased that you've invited me to speak. I wish Stafford, um, you know, a speedy recovery. Uh, and um, obviously, I'm, I, you know, I, I can't replace um, the wealth of knowledge that Stafford has, but um, I'll try my best. The rule of law. Well, what is it? It's a fundamental principle at the core of every democracy. But safeguarding that principle and the defense of the individual against oppression and tyranny on the part of other citizens or of the state and its apparatus requires that there must be robust challenge to bad law and to the state's abuse of the law. That's a quote from a friend of mine and a friend of Ian McDonald's, Professor Gus John. Like any person in a position of public authority, we expect uh, the police to work within the law, to uphold impeccable professional standards, treating everybody equally with fairness, dignity and respect. For some, therefore, it can be a real shock to realise that the very people whom we trust to keep us safe are often so guilty of abusing the most basic of our human rights. In the late 70s and early 80s, um, there were struggles, huge struggles in this country against uh, a police uh, uh, abuses of power, such as the use of the SUS law under Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act 1824, 
The Sus Law was eventually repealed on the 27th of August 1981, and the police abuse of it was thought to have contributed to no small measure to the massive civil disorder in Britain's inner cities that summer, which invariably took the form of rebellions against the police. My colleague Ian MacDonald QC, uh, the former head of Garden Court Chambers, mounted several legal challenges to the government's um, practice at that time. There's a book by Professor Bob Semple called Race, Gel Against Bell. And I quote from um, the opening of that book and it says this, talking about North Kensington. It was a borough in which the author first participated in providing legal advice to members of the community at a free legal advice clinic. It was a borough in which the Black People's Information Centre was located and where the Mangrove Restaurant, a popular venue for Caribbean people, was situated. In 1970, a protest march against police brutality and harassment of Black people took place in Notting Hill. The march led to clashes with the police, charges of incitement to riot and other charges. An old baby trial of nine black defendants known as the Mangrove Nine ensued. The defendants made an application to the judge, Edward Clark, for a jury of their peers. It was accepted there was a discretion vested in the judge at the time to ensure a racially balanced jury. And after several peremptory challenges, the defendants were tried by jury of 10 white and two black people. Ian MacDonald, counsel representing one of the defendants, raised the issue of racial prejudice in society and its relevance to jury selection. Eventually, the defendants were acquitted of the charges of incitement to riot after a hotly contested trial. A Mr. Bruce Douglas Mann gave evidence on behalf of a Mr. Frank Critchlow, the proprietor of the mangrove. The trial was a cause celeb in which it made legal history as the judge. Clark confirmed that there was evidence of racial hatred in the Metropolitan Police Force. This occurred some 28 years before Stephen Lawrence's inquiry finding of the existence of institutional racism, end quote. In the personal tribute paid by Professor Gus John to Ian MacDonald when Ian died in um, late 2019, Gus said this, quote, the first law centre in the UK was the North Kensington Law Centre, which opened in 1970 with Peter Candler as its sole solicitor. Needless to say, the principal issues the law centre engaged in at that time was to do with racial discrimination, welfare rights, especially housing and welfare benefits and policing. Police corruption was rife with frame-ins and brutality par for the course as we as youth and the community workers experience far too often. Targeting, harassing and harassing young people on their way to and from youth clubs or as they followed sound systems was a regular police practice. To ensure the welfare of young people uh, at the juvenile courts, we had to constantly turn up. It was the activities of Nottingdale Police and the infamous PC Pulley in particular that led in time to the community protests that gave rise to the famous Mangrove Nine prosecutions in which the advocacy of the young and fearless MacDonald play, played such a major part in positioning that trial as a political as distinct from a criminal trial in which the Notting Hill police wanted it to be. Gus said, there is no doubt that 
Ian's advocacy in that trial laid the foundations on which he continued to build as an advocate later on in his life, especially in the areas of human rights and criminal law. But what really struck me was this. Gus said it was a time when we in the alliance of the Black Parents Movement, the Black Youth Movement, the Race Today Collective, the Bradford Black Collective, adopted of place in defendants at the center of their defense against the police and the CPS prosecutions and having solicitors and barristers work with the client's testimonies and not to be led by their instinctive reactions to the police or prosecution accounts of the events and circumstances surrounding them. This approach was crucial, not just in cases involving individual young people or adults, but in the prosecutions arising out of civil unrest, rebellions, demonstrations, sit-ins, and police surveillance. It is an approach which characterizes the work of the Mossai Defense Committee, of which Gus was chair. It was one of the approaches that the Haldane lawyers of Haldane supported uh, us in, in preparing defences for scores of young people snatched off the street and in the days that followed the youth rebellion. In his book, Natives, Akala writes this. For Black Britain, the decade began with New Cross, the New Cross fire massacre of 1981, a suspected racist arson attack at 439 New Cross Road where Yvonne Roddock was celebrating her 16th birthday party. 13 party goers burned to death, including the birthday girl. And one of the survivors later committed suicide. Many of the families of the dead have maintained to this day that A, it was an arson attack, and B, the police bungled the investigation and treated the families of the dead like suspects instead of victims. The community suspected that it was an arson attack what was reason perfectly reasonable given that it came in the wake of a string of such racist arson attacks in that area of southeast London. <laughs> The Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, did not even bother to offer her condolences to what were apparently British children and their families. Of course, Thatcher, not in her heart of hearts, expressed sympathy for black British children. She couldn't do so, while at the same time supporting an apartheid government in South Africa. There wasn't a minute's silent, and most of Britain is still completely unaware that it happened, despite the New Cross fire being one of the largest single losses of fire, losses of life in post-war Britain. Nationality Act, the last in the sea onwards who, and whose racialized motivations were barely disguised. British Caribbean people had come to learn that they were indeed second class citizens, as many had long suspected. Those anecdotes and passages really set the scene for what we are about to hear in this uh, discussion about protest. Um, I've been involved in so many of these cases over the last three decades of me practicing at the bar. I was involved in New Cross, um, not the original case, but the um, 
inquest, the second inquest that took place in um, 2004. And when I listened to my clients and the pain that they had just, you know, not being believed, um, being criminalized, being treated not as suspects instead of victims, it's hardly surprising that um, this, the summer of 1981 led to widespread protests um, across the country. The question is this, have things changed? Are um, people of color being treated um, dif differently, disproportionately? Um, I hope that this talk will address that. It's interesting to see that just across the pond on the other side of the Atlantic on the um, 6th of um, January of this year, where you had the insurrection at the Capitol building in, in Washington, DC. It was interesting to see how those protesters who were predominantly white Trump supporters, how that mob was treated compared to how the Black Lives Matter protesters who were less violent, peaceful in the summer of 2020 were treated. Are there differences in the UK? Let's find out. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, I know you have to leave a bit early, but we're incredibly grateful for your insight. And thank you so much for joining us and setting up this discussion so well. Um, our next speaker is going to be Ife Thompson. Ife is the founder of Black Protest Legal Support. She's a community-based activist, writer, human rights defender and barrister, and the founder of two incredible civil society organisations, BLAM UK and BPLS, Black Protest Legal Support. Ife is also a United Nations Fellow for the International Decade for People of African Descent 2015 to 2024. If I work some projects that centre and improve the outcomes of people of African descent in the UK and is also passionate about supporting young people and giving them holistic tools to navigate within society. If I is going to be looking at a his historiography of black protests in the UK. Thank you, if I. Thank you for that kind and warm welcome, Fatima. And uh, just like Lizzie Alactic said, in my regards to Stafford Scott, we need to honour our elders and, and look after them. So I hope that he gets well soon. Um, I have a slideshow for everyone. And uh, as Fatima mentioned, I will be going through um, a short histography because you can't go through everything in 15 minutes, but I'll try to do justice to kind of talk a bit more about the reasons why our communities organise and how we organise, particularly from the 70s, and then bringing it right up to today. And I, I want everyone to kind of bear this quote in mind that often history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, so just a quick um, plug to Black Crisis Legal Support and Blam, you can check us out on social media and find out a lot more about our work there. So I wanted to start off today with a quote from the honorary Asata Shukur. Um, and she says that Black revolutionaries do not just drop from the moon. We are created by our conditions, shaped by our oppression. We are being manufactured in the droves in the ghetto streets. So I'm gonna to start today's presentation looking particularly at the Mangrove Nine restaurant, the Mangrove restaurant, which produced the Mangrove Nine. And I think it's really important to look at the Mangrove and the history around it and, and what the space meant to the community and what the, the demo that happened in um, August uh, 1970, what that meant for the community and why that demo was, was really important. So I've taken a small extract from the Race Today's collective anthology, which, is, which was published by Puto Press in 2019. And I would encourage everyone to read this text if you want to know a lot more about the history of Black British activism. And this piece is called The Invasion of the Mangrove. During the steel band competition in a run up to carnival, the police invaded and attacked the restaurant. The people in the restaurant were attacked by police batons and the building's windows were, and doors were broken. 
This invasion led to no arrests um, and the purpose of the raid was just an excuse to attack, harass and demoralize the community. Frank Critchlow, the owner of the restaurant, has made it very clear that this targeting was because of the presence of groups of black people on the streets of Notting Hill was not a palatable to site for Notting Hill police. In the first year, the police raided my restaurant six times and six times they found nothing. One officer in particular, PC Frank Pulley, ensured that the mangrove was constantly targeted through police raids. The restaurant was raided 12 times between January 1969 and July 1970. So we're seeing all too often uh, black spaces of cultural resistance, uh, black autonomous spaces that have been created for the community um, were targeted by the police, particularly using the excuse of drugs, again, criminalizing the whole community of people, but also um, criminalizing our cultural space. Um, and particularly mangrove was, was really important because as you can see um, in the Race of the Day extract, it talks about the steel band competition in the run up to carnival. The steel band is um, an instrument play particularly um, it came from Trinidad and it's uh, an illusion and, and a, a mixture of historical African traditions of drumming and um, with much more newer um, traditions by the people of African descent using steel pans um, and it, it's very interesting that the police decided to continue attacking this space not only because it was a cultural space of resistance in a very very white Eurocentric world that they were living in in Britain but it was also the fact that um, they continued to attack the restaurant even though they found nothing there, they continue to, to attack and to frustrate the community. Um, so I think it's really important that we understand what um, our community was going through at the time in terms of complete harassment from the police. I mean, 12 times in the space of one year is, you know, a lot to handle. And, um, you know, the community were frustrated and they were fed up. So we see that in um, August 1970, the community had no choice but to actually rise up. And if you've watched the Small Acts documentary, uh, Frank Critchlow says that, you know, I don't want this to become a political space. I don't want it to be um, a space in which we are, you know, having to have a protest. And then um, Althea says to him that we have no choice but to do this like th this is our only option because our community is being harassed this cultural space that we've come together to to break bread in to share West Indian culture and to reassert our blackness is being under constant threat so the only option the community had was to organize uh, and form resistance so we see that on the day of the march a, a small group of people only 200 people were met with 700 police officers so they almost brought the whole of uh, metropolitan police service into full action for a small group of black people and then uh, you know in, in in their tradition continue to beat up and, and harass the community as we protest for our rights um, and Althea in the video that was played earlier talked about we are tired of complaining to police about police we're tired of complaining to judges about judges so it, this uh, mangrove protest was a reflection of what was going on in society as a whole but also um, a reflection of how cultural black spaces that black people have created have been attacked um, by the state and its agents. So I thought it would be good to give a, a bit more context um, around the Bricks and Uprising. Obviously, I mentioned the Mangrove Nine um, protest, which was in 1970, a whole 10 years before the Bricks and Uprisings. Um, so I thought it would be good to kind of give a, a context to what was going on between that, that those 10 years and what the conditions of the Black community were at the time and why we had such a periphery of many Black organisations resisting and asserting the rights of Black people. Um, so young Blacks co um, combined under the Black Power banner to combat police violence and corruption inside the uh, Black community. So that's what Darkus Howard notes. And the conditions of the Black community, particularly in the 70s and 80s, was that of extreme police brutality, uh, racism in schools. So I'm not sure if you guys know about Bernard Coward's um, book about how the West Indian child is made educationally subnormal talking about particularly uh, how the British state, uh, inclusion with the education department, created these IQ tests that were going to, um, well, not going to, they actually did ensure that black children were put in schools that were way below their um, educational attainment and below their um, educational capacities. Um, and the tests that they created for them were created only in line with um, British values and British understanding of things so that those that had come straight from the Caribbean wouldn't be able to answer the test adequately, but it didn't mean that they were 
educationally any 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 less intelligent. So what we're seeing is that you had about thirty percent of students in these uh, special needs schools were black black children, um, and you know a lot of parents didn't really challenge this because coming from the Caribbean, there was a real understanding that whatever the teacher said was right, and that uh, you know if the teacher said there's something wrong, then we listen to the teachers when. It, uh, Bernard Coward, who was doing his PhD at Sussex University, undercovered this scandal. Um, Jessica and Eric Cutley, along with New Beacon Press, published his um, findings and let the community know about what was going on with the young people. So you could see a lot of resentment in terms of how black children were being treated at this time. Um, and then also you had a lot of white racist attacks on the black community. So whether that be firebombs in their homes, whether that be, you know, attacking of black bookshops like the New Beacon and um, like Bogle of Lachur, who was attacked many times by a national front. And then what we'd also see is that a complete complicity or, you know, lack of action from the police. And then what we had as well was that many members of national front were also in the police force. So, you know, there was a complete disregard to the well-being and welfare of the black community uh, and, and nobody seemed to care. So we see in 1975, there was a forming of the Black Parents Movement. Um, and this again was um, the key people in this movement were Jessica and Eric Hutley, um, following the arrest and assault of a black schoolboy called Cliff uh, McDell on the pretense that he had actually uh, stolen from a white woman, stolen her handbag, because there was a lot, a lot of scaremongering around this phenomenon of mugging at the time. Um, you know, the black parents rose up because particularly Cliff McDan McDaniel was a young person that was really involved in the Pan-African schools. He was an upstanding member of the community and a lot of parents knew him. So when they said that he was arrested for mugging, everybody was like, what's that about? That can't be true. So they decided to uh, create the black parents movement uh, in, as a direct result of um, the police attack on Cliff McDonald, I mean McDaniel, sorry. So we're seeing that particularly um, these movements that have been created, like the Black Parents Movement, as a direct result of our oppression, as in it was the only only way in which the community could actively resist um, this brutality and, and an attack on the community. So they also staged protests. But there was a protest outside Hornsey Police Station. Uh, they created a defence fund um, for Cliff McDaniel, and they also had some Black pro lawyers who provided some bonus support to the family and due to all the community's activism, there was a lot of leafleting going around, a lot of awareness raising, um, and through the community support and picketing outside the court, um, and also the lawyers being able to um, bring the holistic issues that were apparent in the case to um, the court, um, Cliff McDaniel was found not guilty. So we can see how this, this need for um, um, community activism changed the trajectory, particularly around how um, the community ran their cases, but also awareness raising to the public at large about what was going on to black children for black children at the time as well. Um, and I wanted to highlight again what Douglas Howe was saying, particularly when looking at lawyers at this time. Um, so in uh, 1992, again in the Race Today Collective book. Um, Darkest How talks about in the 70, 1970s, radical lawyers, black and white, would um, who would challenge police evidence didn't exist at the time. So conviction would often come through very thick and fast, and magistrates would tend to rubber stamp um, police evidence. There was a lot of mistrust, particularly from the black community towards lawyers, because they uh, weren't willing to put forward any political arguments. They weren't willing to, uh, you know, take a stand to the racism that was going on, and they would again just go uh, go along with what was uh, being given by the police, and they wouldn't challenge challenge that evidence. So there was a real need for the community to have activism outside the courts because that was any space where they could speak their truth. Um, in line with that, you had the launch of um, the Freedom News by the British Black Panthers, whose headquarters were the Shakespeare Road in Brixton. And again, they uh, created this newspaper to highlight um, police malpractice, particularly um, Brixton police against the uh, black community. Um, and one of their key campaigns was the campaign of, of Joshua Francis, uh, a young man who was coming home and was attacked by a, a mob of a four uh, white boys. And one of the uh, white boys was actually an undercover police officer. So it was seen in terms of um, the normality of the police to just attack and, and maim black bodies was something that was happening um, ever so often at the time. Um, and uh, particularly with, with um, the Joshua Francis campaign, the British Black Panthers um, did a lot of leafleting, did a lot of community organising, did a lot of protest and got the community on board. And um, that really helped in raising awareness of what was going on. Um, and it was such a popular way of um, campaigning that um, after the success of the, of the campaign, um, 
other groups across the UK decided to take up the Black British Panthers approach. And um, as part of that, they, they then launched in 1971, the National Conference on the Rights of Black People as well. So you can see actively the community was seeing what could we do to rise up against the oppression that we're experiencing in Britain. So this is a newspaper that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a 1973 edition, and you can see right here, police terror must stop. And you'll see a, a brutalized picture of a black man and all these officers around them. So you see the community was actively organizing, you know, using leaflets and newspapers to let people know what was going on. Um, so I mentioned earlier was the New Course Massacre. And I thought it'd be really good to showcase um, Linton Quincy Johnson, who was actually a member of the Black British um, Panthers in the UK. He grew up in Brixton as well, was really involved in the Race Day Collective and is an amazing artist. And I think it was really, really important to um, understand and listen to different forms of art production and medium. So I've got a few of um, Lyndon Quasey Johnson's clips to play. And this one is about the New Cross Massacre. Some of you will recall in January of 1981, 13 uh, black children were murdered in a fire when racist and fascists threw an incendiary device into a house at 439 New Cross Road and uh, there was a cover-up by the police. The black community responded with the Black People's Day of Action when 20, nearly 20,000 people marched from New Cross to Hyde Park. And this uh, represented a turning point in the struggles of black people in Britain. New Cross Massacre. First, the coming and the going in and out of the party. The dubbing and the rubbing and the rocking to the rhythm. The dancing and the skanking and the party really swinging. Then the crash and the bang and the flame start to trunk. The heat and the smoke and the people start to choke. The screaming and the crying and the dying in the fire. We didn't know what could have happened, you know. Anytime, anywhere. Far don't it happen to we and the Asians, them already. But in spite of all that, everybody was still shocked when we get the cold facts about that brutal attack, when we find out about the fire over New Cross, about the innocent life them we lost, about the physically scared, the mentally marred, and them relatives who take it so hard. But wait, you know, remember, how the whole of Black Britain did rock with grief. How the whole of Black Britain turned a melancholy blue. Not the possible blue of the murderer's eyes, but like the smoke of gloom on that cold Sunday morning. But stop. You know, remember. How the whole of Black Britain did rock with rage. How the whole of Black Britain turned a fiery red. Not the callous red of the killer's eyes, but red with rage, like the flames of the fire. So again, you, um, Lyndon Quasi Thompson talks about um, the incident, the massacre, the police cover up, and particularly how the community were feeling at the time, which is one of very much neglect. Um, and if you are able to read more, particularly around the Newcastle massacre, you will find um, more information about particularly the organizing and how they were able to get so much people to come down and to ensure that people knew about what's happened in New Cross and how we can get justice for the community because we knew that the institution, that's the police, uh, were doing what they know best, which was producing and, and ensuring that uh, there was going to be no justice for black victims. Um, and what we saw was the community come together and actually at least um, get their side of the um, get their side of the of the issue out on. In, in the open and also what you had with the black, with the black parents um, group is they had a commission that they created in which they found their own fact-finding mission to ensure that what really happened was actually 
accurately portrayed so the community created their own institutions of justice and, and, and their own institutions of, of truth seeking and they used that to continue to challenge the mainstream narrative that was being produced by the police and the, and the press about what happened to their children and what happened to them that day and it's also good to note that just this 18th of January was 40 years since the New Cross massacre. Um, Another thing that's really important to note is the police surveillance of um, black community organizers. Um, so there was a black power desk that was established in 1967 by under the order of Roy Jenkins, the then home secretary, who was based in um, New Scotland Yard. And this black power desk group was staffed by as many as six officers. Um, the, this desk had a lot of early successes, particularly um, in the role of Ogbe Egmona, who was a key uh, founder, member of the British Black Panther Party. And they ensured that he was convicted in 1968 of incitement to murder police officers because of an essay he wrote encouraging black people to resist police violence collectively. So we're seeing the same tactics used in America, particularly with Corinthian Pro, to target and to infiltrate black organizations. And then in 1970, the death started to see an upturn in a more black radical activity and their resources expanded and they collectively um, put all their resources together to over um, drive and to, to ensure that um, they could manipulate and try and manipulate the mangrove trial, which they weren't able to do. And they targeted and effectively brutalized and neutralized the Black Panther Party in Brixton. So we see that particularly after the case I mentioned with Joshua and all the community organizing, um, the state reacted to this um, youth revolt that they, they had created at the time. And they decided to um, use political trials to arrest many of the leaders in the Black British Panther Party um, and a lot of their supporters. So that led to um, the movement not being able to survive because if all the leaders are in prison or all the leaders are in court, um, court hearings over and over again, resources are going towards legal fees um, and you've got you know a whole movement being crushed be because of the power of the state um, literally crushing them. So what we're seeing is that the state was reacting by having a lot of undercover policing um, and reacting disproportionately because of the threat of of these groups that wasn't there at all but the state wanted to crush it before it could even expand um, and this black power desk remained active until the mid 70s and they kept a lot of black activists under surveillance so now moving on to the Brixton uprisings I again I wanted to, sh to showcase a quick clip um, by Linton Quasi Johnson talking about the uprising and he calls it the great insurrection <laughs> So again, we're just seeing Lyndon Johnson talking about um, the need for the community to rise up, particularly because of the soft laws, because of the oppression, because of uh, how black communities were being treated. So it was a day of liberation. And he then mentions how it spread across the whole of, of the UK. And he, he, he makes it saying he makes it clear to everyone that he wishes he was there. Um, but, you know, we're seeing the clips of just how the community needs to rise up at the time. Um, a really, really interesting group I found when I was doing my research was the Brixton Defence Campaign. Uh, not many people know about them. And they were formed uh, mainly by two forces, the Brixton Black Women's Group and the Black People Against State, State Harassment. Um, and it's, in its own press release, it talks about the group's um, was formed mainly to coordinate a defence for those that were arrested during the Brixton uprisings. He had about 500 people that were arrested during the uprising, so they needed legal support. So they were going to support those that were being victimised. And the campaign group worked directly with the Brixton Legal Defence Group. Um, and when we're seeing a lot of the work they were doing, they talk about, when going through a lot of their notes, they talk a lot about um, the fact that people are not having the right to a jury by their, a trial by a jury by their peers. A lot of the people that were arrested were almost being forced to uh, 
have a trial in front of magistrates and particularly at the time as Dr. Howard mentioned earlier the magistrates would always rubber stamp police evidence so they wouldn't challenge the police evidence and that would ensure a lot of the activists and campaigners would end up being um, imprisoned so the Brixton defence campaign was really worried about that so they staged protests outside of the courts particularly Canberra courts and a few other magistrates I can't remember them off the top of my head uh, and but they got the community to know what was going on and they actively helped in ensuring that they had a legal defence and also a political defence um, to aid them. Um, another um, thing which I thought was really important is the international aspect of the Brixton defence campaign and how they always thought internationally. So they were really concerned with the denial of human rights of black people in Britain and in their notes from their meeting on 27th of July 1981, they called on African and Caribbean High Commissioners to reach out to the United Nations and the European Commission on Human Rights to inform them about the ongoing human rights violations that black people were undergoing in Britain. So they were thinking, how can we hold the British state to account as well? What else can we be doing to ensure that our human rights are being utilised and being, and, being, and being actually defended? And they were thinking, you know, we need to bypass the state and think internationally. So I thought that was really, really interesting. So again, this is just a bit more of their goals, showing that the Brixton Uprising was a legitimate protest to ensure there was full legal representation and to continue to fight against police oppression of, of the black community. And this, this image just kind of showcased particularly what's going on in the magistrate's court in terms of justice not being blind. Now moving forward to today quickly about our current conditions as a community. Um, I'm sure many of you are already aware, um, but in terms of how uh, black people are treated in this country, we have uh, black people disproportionately dying um, between the years of 2018 2019. Even though we only make up 3% of the population, we make up 8% of the deaths in custody, and we have you know, ongoing international and regional human rights violations to all insects of black life. And we're seeing even in like, police custody, black children are more likely to um, have use of force used against them than any other ethnicity in custody. Again, even the first lockdown, we had 22,000 stops and searches of young black men, and 80% of these searches led to no further action. So we're seeing, you know, almost history rhyming again in terms of how the community is being oppressed, how the community is being policed, and how we are being denied our rights. So again, with the George Floyd movement, uh, the black community um, decided that we had to rise up and, and show solidarity, particularly with America, and also to showcase how, you know, ongoing loss of life to black people in this country as well. So you've got the case of Mark Duggan, you've got the case of Rashawn Charles in terms of the devaluation and the violation of human rights of black people in this country. Um, so I was saying that BLM is a continued resistance and it's a tradition of, of black resistance um, just going further. Um, so for me, particularly looking at my formation of black process legal support, it was really important for us to ensure there was legal support on the ground for the black community and particularly legal observers. Um, I went to the BLM marches in 2016 and I noted that one there wasn't any legal observers and a, a lot of people had just spoken to me after told me that particularly at the marches that were in central London there was a lot of arbitrary arrests loads of people being attacked by the police and there was nobody there to defend their rights so I said that you know if there was ever going to be a need for us to have protest again or BLM protest I would try and ensure that we had legal observers and um, I was you know so delighted when so many lawyers took up the call to support that process legal support, particularly on the first um, two days of the protest on the 3rd and the 6th and 7th of June, we was able to have at least 100 uh, lawyers on the ground. And what made that process legal support so unique is the fact that we was able to have so many lawyers on the ground, normally with a lot of activism, it's the community showing up. But what we had now is actually people that with legal backgrounds being able to support the community using their legal skills to defend their rights to protest, but also defend against police brutality and ensuring accountability for police malpractice. Even though we had a uh, LOs, which legal observers on the uh, protest, we notice a lot of differential treatment between our black and brown legal observers compared to our white legal observers. So we noticed that the police were, you know, constantly attacking our black and brown legal observers. Many of them were being pushed to the ground. You know, they were really undermining us um, compared to how they treated our white LOs that were with us. They wouldn't touch them or they wouldn't use as much force towards them. So we're even seeing towards our legal observers a lot of racist policing as well. Um, and then another thing that we noticed as uh, legal observers at the protests in 2020 was just the sheer disproportionate amount of police presence at the BLM protests. You know, it didn't warrant that amount, amount of police and it came, they came in a very militarised form, you know, ready to 
ready for attack and we saw that they were uh, because they came with that mindset any excuse to use disproportionate force they they, they went with it um, so we saw you know a lot of police violence at these arrests we saw a lot of arbitrary arrests and we saw detention of many many um, police protesters uh, and what particularly uh, was shocking for me as a legal observer on the 6th of June was when the police charged horses at 200 protesters at Downing Street without any warning and what was of note was where the, police, the, the horses were coming from all the protesters were face this way and the horses were coming this way so what we saw is that people were literally running for their lives and one girl was actually knocked unconscious because of a of, of the police force that trampled on her so again heightened levels of police violence and just a complete violation of a protesters human rights so we was really really concerned and, and when we was there was able to take a note of this and, and, and to raise alarm bells of what the police had done but we're seeing again history rhyme in terms of the, the amount of police aggression uh, black protesters were being met with another thing that was of concern for us as as well was the containment also known as kettling of the BLM protesters um, and the use of section 50 of the Peace Reform Act um, so this act does give specific powers to the police um, which allows them to ask for name and address of people um, who were the, the police constable um, reasonably believes that that individual has been acting in an antisocial manner but what, what we saw in the in the kettling is that the police were using the section 50 uh, as a blanket ban power which in the case of Mangesha, that was found to be unlawful. You can't use um, the Section 50 of the Reform Act um, to obtain information um, from people um, at will. So particularly, we was really concerned about that because they were using it as a, as a price to leave the kettle. So in order for you to leave the kettle, you had to give the police your data, which again is a violation looking at the case of Mangesha. So uh, our legal designers were able to assert people's rights for them and was able to let them know about their rights um, and able to at least raise awareness, particularly online, about what was going on in the kettle and uh, ensure that people didn't give over um, their, their, their ID to leave the, leave the kettle. So again, we're seeing the police, you know, not learning from past abuses, but also not learning from even past case law. Um, and then lastly, as mentioned, um, we saw, you know, a lot of human rights violations against BLM protesters, excessive use of force, uh, um, our black, black protesters as well, which was something that was picked up in a NetPol report as well. And then there was also a neglect of survivors of racist violence. So when the far right um, protesters came to London, um, they attacked several um, black protesters that were in the vicinity. And we saw that police, instead of actually helping those that were attacked, they then actually proceeded to stop and search them and criminalize the black protesters. Um, so we're seeing again, a lot of racism, racial discrimination policing at the BLM protests. And I just wanted to, um, to wrap up with what the UN has um, said. The UN working group of people have been sent a report around um, the protests globally. And this is what they said. They said, globally, widespread protests have illustrated how people of African descent and others recognize the lack of visibility and the disregard and police violence, which they are victim to in local practices and in their own communities. Mass demonstrations were held for weeks in capitals and all around the world, um, and including all 50 states of the United States. So in terms of just this globalized issue, which I think is something to always remember, because particularly when looking at what Douglas Howe said, the community is rising up against injustice that is globalized. So in terms of the anti blackness in community, um, us as a community, we've always been pushing back. And this, um, what we saw last year, particularly in terms of um, all the support around BLM, it wasn't anything new. This is just black people continuing tradition of resisting racist policing and racist oppression of black people. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Ife. That was really enlightening and, and, and really thorough. And thanks also for bringing in what's happening on the ground today at the BLM protest. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Michael Etienne, who is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers. Mike has a broad public law and human rights practice encompassing actions against the state in various forms, but with a focus on cases involving detaining authorities, particularly police forces and prisons. He's frequently instructed on cases that give rise to issues of systemic discrimination, whether in detention context or in his education law work. He takes an active interest in issues of diversity and inclusion in the legal profession and is a member of the steering committees of the Black Barristers Network, the Black Men in Law Network, and, recent, and the recently launched Bridging the Bar. 
He won the Future Leader Diversity and Inclusion Award in the Chambers Awards 2020 and was shortlisted in the Young Pro Bono Barrister of the Year category in the Advocate Pro Bono Awards 2020. And Mike is going to, to talk us through, Mike is also a, a committee member of Black Protest Legal Support and he's going to take us through some additional challenges and threats to protest today, particularly in light of the pandemic and the, the various legal tools that are being used to control protesters. Thank you, Mike. Um, Fatima, thanks so much um, for that introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, in the time that I have uh, over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I I'm just gonna look forward um, to some of the challenges that we can expect to be facing uh, in the weeks, months, years ahead in the context of um, protesting and defending the right to protest. Um, and I haven't done a um, bells and whistles presentation, but what I do propose to do is kind of address uh, the topic of my presentation in, in three parts. Um, broadly, um, looking at just the pandemic, um, political pushback, uh, and then Parliament data and technology, um, because I think there is uh, a, a real battle coming up in Parliament um, in that context. Um, but I think my sort of starting point is we sort of know what's coming uh, because we've seen most of it already. Uh, some of it we've seen recently. Uh, and as the speakers before me have kind of set out in, in such colourful detail, um, we, we know how the state responds to protest and generally speaking, its response is to crack down on it um, as much as it can. And I think that the pandemic has presented some fundamental challenges to defending the right to protest in a way that um, like so much of the pandemic, we perhaps uh, hadn't anticipated in quite this way before. Um, so turning then to just looking at the pandemic generally, uh, and, you know, there's a tendency to kind of look at this as a, uh, in very broad terms, as a question of where the balance is to be struck between protecting the right to protest and protecting public health. Uh, and, you know, that's a question that really, in many contexts, but I think particularly in the context of Black Lives Matter and protesting and challenging racial injustice, presents a false binary. Um, many of you will have seen the initial responses to the Black Lives Matter protests in the UK uh, from its detractors who were very quick to anticipate that it would be Black Lives Matter that would be responsible for making um, the spread of coronavirus worse and questioning why they were people who are demanding injustice um, would continue to do that during the course of the pandemic as if it wasn't Black communities uh, and other communities uh, of colour who were bearing um, the biggest brunt of the pandemic. But because the pandemic is affecting uh, people of colour so disproportionately badly, that also underlines the importance of protest uh, and the, defending the right of people to speak out. Because if it's not at the height of a pandemic, which in the UK alone, just today uh, on the government's own figures, uh, has claimed more than 100,000 lives, uh, wh when, when do we stand up and say that this is a right that we will continue to protect? Uh, so it is a racial justice issue, it's a social justice issue, uh, because ultimately what we know about the experience of injustice uh, is that those who are most often compelled to protest are those people from already marginalised communities, whether that's marginalised on race or gender or gender identity um, uh, or any of the other areas where we know that injustice is, is suffered most acutely. But what the legal regime that we have at the moment under the um, current version of the, uh, what I'll just call the coronavirus regulations, I won't ask anyone to tell me which version of those regulations that we're, um, that we're now on, um, although if you want the full title, it's the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions All Tiers England Regulations 2020 um, that were amended to give effect to our current national lockdown. But what that does um, is it introduces, and I, I'll talk in a bit more detail about some of this, but complex and demanding requirements uh, for being allowed to organise a protest 
uh, and that really does shift the balance in, in quite a profound way. Uh, and I think one of the, the real challenges, and we know this in, in any analysis of kind of the legal protection for rights, once rights are lost, it can often be very difficult to get them back. And I think that all of us who have a concern in the protection of the right to protest are going to have a real challenge to make sure that whenever we get back to whatever semblance of normality awaits us, however many years hence, um, is that we haven't ceded the fundamental ground that says, apart from anything else, what we are facing in legal terms is an emergency situation. And this, the new normal can't be the current status quo. We can't have um, one of the other uh, tragic legacies of this pandemic to be that fundamental rights and the position that, you know, the very little ground that we've made in establishing those rights being ceded um, in, the, in the wake of the pandemic. And that matters, obviously, to all of us as people who are concerned about the right to protest, but it's also worth bearing in mind and repeating um, as often and as widely as possible, there is an obligation on the state to facilitate the right to protest. And the pandemic has not done away with that obligation. Uh, we have not fortunately derogated from our obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights, for example. Uh, and so, you know, the state has got to answer that challenge. And I think there's still room for de to debate about whether that balance um, is being um, struck in the right way at the moment. And again, although I've referred to the most recent version of the coronavirus regulations, when the lockdown one started, uh, the protection of the right to protest was at best implicit. It wasn't until several versions later that we got what we now have, which is an explicit recognition of the right of certain groups as organisers to arrange uh, and to organise protests. And I, for me, that's quite telling as to the thinking about the balancing of fundamental rights during the course of the pandemic. And of course, you know, we are all concerned about the spread of the virus and the impact of the virus that it's having on people um, up and down the country. But I think it's often too simplistic to say, well, we're dealing with a pandemic, this is a highly contagious disease. And so that means we have to just see ground on all of our fundamental rights. Um, the challenge must be, particularly if what we're likely to face is an endemic problem of coronavirus, is how we balance that as we go forwards and we have to adjust to life um, with coronavirus that, that remains um, endemic in the population. Um, I touched on the demanding and complex requirements for arranging protests. Um, in very broad terms, in order to now lawfully organise a public gathering um, of protest, you have to be an organised, you, well, you have to be from a, uh, from a, a company, a benevolent organisation, a charitable group or a political group uh, in order to be an organiser of a protest. But in addition to those requirements, you also have to complete um, you have to satisfy different statutory requirements in terms of health and safety and risk assessments in relation to dealing with the risk of COVID. So what the legislation says is you have to you have to conduct uh, a, a regulation compliant uh, uh, health and safety uh, assessment. But in addition to that, the regulations say that you have to undertake, quote, all, reason all reasonable measures to limit the risk of transmission. Um, query how that might operate in practice if it were challenged in terms of what the distance one has to travel is between conducting the risk assessment um, and then taking all reasonable steps um, in addition to that. Now, of course, there is some reference back to what your risk assessment has told you, um, but it seems to me that there's potential scope for argument about how much further beyond your risk assessment and what your risk assessment tells you um, that you might be called upon to do in order, in order to organise a protest. Um, now, on one hand, they, they, these kind of seem like quite dry legal requirements, but in the context of the history that um, others have, have set out, um, this is a really big problem, because although the regulations create 
um, a space for protests to be organised. In practical terms, what they prevent is spontaneous or reactive protests. Uh, you know, court solidarity at short notice, people arrested, as they so often are, uh, and whisked off to the sales to be produced before magistrates uh, um, at fairly short notice, as has happened uh, in the summer that we saw on plenty of occasions. But also in, in some more recent cases of, of protesters who have been arrested, which I'm going to come to in a second. But what we see tracking back from the history of mangrove, the history of the uh, New Cross fire protests, the Brixton uprisings, is that short notice, reactive protests, actions of solidarity have been central to the protest movement. Uh, and the way that the regulations currently operate presents a real challenge to that, because for many groups, it's just not likely, I wouldn't have thought anyway, to be practically possible to meet those requirements. And of course, if you're found to be in breach of the regulations, whether as an individual attending uh, an unlawful gathering and or as an organiser, you're potentially facing very significant fines and or prosecutions. <clears throat> and the reality is that the as I said, the pandemic isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and, you know, the initial signs about what that means for the right to protest have not been encouraging. Uh, back, in the, back in the summer of uh, last year, uh, Leslie and I were involved um, in a case that related to Ken Hines, somebody who wanted to organise the Million People March in London. Uh, and the Metropolitan Police had uh, initially threatened um, to... Uh, prosecute uh, the organisers of that protest, suggesting it was in contravention of the regulations that were in force at that time. Fortunately, the Metropolitan Police were persuaded that their reading of the regulations was wrong and the protest went ahead. But there have been a number of um, instances since then um, that don't offer much encouragement in terms of how the authorities are trying to strike the balance. Uh, just this in the last few days, uh, there was a protest in Cardiff uh, following the death um, of Mohammed Hassan in police custody. Well, uh, just a couple of days after being released from police custody, uh, and the uh, organizer of that protest was uh, reportedly fined um, five hundred pounds for organizing a gathering in contravention of the regulations in force in Wales. Uh, and just again in the last week or so, uh, colleagues at Black Protest Legal Support have um, been discussing the uh, decision of the Avon and Somerset police um, to arrest four people for attending a protest outside Bristol Crown Court. In fact, I think yesterday um, in an expression of solidarity with those who are being prosecuted for, for tearing down the uh, Colston statue. So, uh, of course, it's not yet clear what might happen in those cases. But again, they're telling indicators of the, the, the real challenges that we are still going to face going forwards. And I, th I think if there's one other thing that we know, it's that as the police become uh, subjectively at least more confident in the range of powers they have, the more likely they are to use them. The soundings out that we've had recently from Cressida Dick at the top of the Metropolitan Police down has been, I think, suggestive that the um, approach of uh, inform, encourage and persuade, although still there in practice, there will be much less reticence to move to enforcement, which means fines and potential prosecutions more quickly. And even when we had a situation where, you know, there was lots of uh, a lack of clarity in the law, people who were uh, disproportionately receiving fines were, surprise, surprise, uh, people who are members of the Black uh, and South Asian communities, those who are most typically overrepresented in all of the figures that IFE has just um, sent to you, particularly in the context of, of Black men and deaths in custody. Uh, and perhaps one question just to think about, uh, one of the, uh, from my point of view, you know, one of the oldest forms of standing protest in London at its heart, when you look at its roots and its origins, and that's what we're tracking through this evening, 
is Notting Hill Carnival, a community demonstration of their right to exist in the places in which they lived whilst those around them sought to prevent them from doing so. And uh, there's a real question, I think, about what the future for Notting Hill will be uh, in the years ahead. We know that the authorities have been falling over themselves for decades to look for reasons to prevent Notting Hill from taking place. Obviously, while the pandemic is at its height, you can't have carnivals and mass gatherings. But at some point we will, we hope, uh, move beyond where we are now. Uh, and again, I think Notting Hill might be uh, uh, a useful example of looking at whether we get back something that we've had to temporarily suspend um, quite rightly as a result of the pandemic. Moving then to the political pushback, and I've, I've touched on this already in terms of what the police have been saying more recently in terms of indicating that they're more uh, inclined to take enforcement action more quickly than they were at the start of the pandemic. But as always, uh, as we see with anything that looks like progress in the context of protest movements and campaigns for justice is the pushback. And in the last Queen's speech, the government announced something it decided to call the Police Powers and Protections Bill, um, which uh, is tellingly supported, in fact, was actively welcomed, I think, by the Police Federation. Uh, and it's going to it, it proposed some fairly significant reforms to the um, current legislation uh, regulating protests uh, in the Public Order Act. Um, because the police ha had convinced the government that they needed to have more powers in their arsenal. Uh, now, what that is likely to mean, for example, is that where last year you had the success of a High Court challenge that said it was unlawful for the um, relevant uh, senior police officer to um, purport to declare the whole of London um, as being covered by Section 14 restrictions on protest under the Public Order Act. Um, this legislation clearly seeks to challenge some of that ground and take some of that ground back um, so that the police can be empowered potentially to impose very significant restrictions, not just on processions, uh, that is to say moving protests, but also static gatherings. Uh, and that would obviously have a very significant impact uh, on the right to protest. In October, so just before the Queen's speech, um, Her Majesty's Inspector of Policing uh, announced that they had been charged with the Home Secretary by uh, considering the policing of protests uh, and the, I'm just looking at their terms of reference and it's called Terms of Reference Inspection of the Policing of Protests. Uh, and that is set up to examine uh, one, how the police manage intelligence about protests, two, how well do the police plan and prepare their response to protests? Uh, three, how well do police collaborate in relation to protests? Uh, and this is apparently a reference to uh, mutual aid and other forms of collaboration between forces and other organizations. Four, how effective uh, are decision-making processes and how do they affect the police response to protests? Five, does current legislation give the police the powers they need to deal effectively with protests? Uh, and uh, this, I've just read that from the um, um, inspectorate's website, but one thing that strikes me from reading that is very much like the consultations around the use of judicial review and the Human Rights Act, the framing seems to imply a problem rather than approaching it from a positive perspective of this is our obligation to facilitate the right to protest. How do we ensure that we're complying with it? Now, you know, for many people that won't come as a surprise, um, but it's an important reflection nonetheless. Um, but I think there's also a slightly wider context to look at the challenges um, coming our way in terms of protecting the, uh, the right to protest. Uh, you know, there, the, there is a, in my, in my view, there is a fight um, being waged in terms of trying to undo uh, and undermine as much as possible the findings of the McPherson inquiry uh, and its uh, recognition of a long-standing fact amongst black communities about institutional racism in policing. Um, 
anyone who saw the 20 year anniversary documentary that the BBC did about the death of Stephen Lawrence will have seen police officers speaking in that documentary, now retired, who resisted the finding of institutional racism at the time. Uh, and now we have a commissioner in office who thinks that talking about uh, and focusing on the uh, fatal reality of institutional racism in policing is, um, to use her description, unhelpful. But in addition to that, we have the Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities um, due to report in the next few months, chaired by somebody in Tony Sewell who rejects uh, any focus on uh, institutional racism as a preference of focusing on a victim mentality. Uh, so there is this wider context of pressure being applied again um, to try and, I think, undo through law and politics um, some of the important gains uh, that, that previous um, generations have achieved. Uh, and that's, I think, particularly striking when you bear in mind that for all those so-called successes, the death in custody figures are still uh, the travesty that they are the disproportionate rates of stop and search, the disproportionate rates of uh, use of force, the disproportionate numbers of black and brown children detained in our uh, prison systems is still um, eye-wateringly high. Um, but I think that that's a, an important wider context in which to see um, some of this. Uh, one other aspect of parliamentary legislation that I ought to have touched on uh, is the Covert, Covert Human Intelligence Sources Bill, um, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of. Uh, but it's important because I think it was Ife who touched on uh, the issue of infiltration. If there's one consistent theme of every justice movement, whether it's racial justice, social justice, or environmental justice, it's attempts by the state to infiltrate those movements uh, and to have people in those movements um, pretending to be people that they're not and duping the duping people into uh, in some cases forming intimate relationships with them um, but on on any level trusting them often at, at points of acute grief and trauma the sort of um, behavior that is um, being examined at the moment in the so-called public inquiry into undercover policing um, but in short, that bill, if it passes in its current form, will authorise some of the worst excesses of police infiltration uh, that we've seen. And that's an inquiry that um, includes a number of interested groups, but including um, the Lawrence family and other families um, who have been spied on by the state during the course of the, you know, the height of their grief. Uh, and I think if that bill passes in its current form, uh, it's not just the right to protest uh, in its most obvious manifestations in terms of the public order legislation, for example, but also what that means for community organizing and the safety of, of the spaces that we have been trying to create uh, and defend. Um, lastly, then I'm conscious of time, just to touch very briefly on the issue of uh, data and technology. Um, the police are getting increasingly uh, tooled up more and more savvy in terms of processing and dealing with data. Uh, and we know that from the way um, in which, for example, they have units set up to um, scour the internet, scour social media for a whole range of things from protest group organizings to drill videos that the police decide they don't like and want to take down. Um, but also, of course, and perhaps most obviously in the context of uh, facial recognition. Uh, last year, we saw a really important um, judgment in the case of uh, Bridges and the Chief Constable of South Wales Police, uh, which found that the uh, South Wales Police Force's trial of automated facial recognition uh, technology was unlawful for a whole range of reasons. Uh, it was the first judgment that dealt with automated uh, facial recognition technology, certainly in this jurisdiction, and found breaches of Article 8, the right to privacy, uh, breach of the Data Protection Act and also failure by the um, police to have due regard to the public sector equality duty. But what that case doesn't touch on at all is the fundamental question of principle about whether or not we should be having facial recognition. Uh, and, you know, when it was 
first mooted as being deployed by the police. You know, there's been lots of discussion and analysis of the fact that you know this technology is very bad at recognizing um, anybody who's not a white man. Uh, personally, in some ways, probably just as well. The police probably don't need any help uh, uh, in that regard. Um, but you know, the fight. I think there are lots of groups campaigning and challenging. Um, the use of facial recognition technology. And I, I think it's likely that police forces and others, whether it's local authorities or private organisations, um, who would certainly be caught by the GDPR and um, uh, in, in terms of looking at that judgment and finding out, OK, well, how can we operate facial recognition technology in a way that complies with the law? Um, because, again, it's not dealing with the principle. So there are going to be further challenges and, the, and as the technology improves, those challenges will become even more acute because um, we know that whatever technological means are available to the police, they, they will adopt. Uh, and that is not a trivial thing. Uh, you know, for many people, uh, just the prospect of being surveilled by the police uh, might be enough to discourage them um, from protest. And of course, we also have to remember that the state's record of data collection, generally speaking, is uh, doesn't fill many of us with confidence. Uh, and we perhaps need only need only to think about the gangs matrix, which the uh, information commissioner found um, in breach of, uh, again, of data protection and the GDPR. Um, but no doubt that hasn't gone too far away either. So lots of challenges ahead. Um, I hope that hasn't sounded too depressing. Um, if there's one thing that we know as lawyers, as people who stand in solidarity with campaigners and protest movements, it's that we have the means uh, to rise to the uh, to the occasion. Um, there are challenges ahead, uh, but forwards ever, backwards never. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we, we're running slightly over, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, Dave. Um, and hopefully I can see some really interesting questions in the Q&A. So if you, you're able to stay with us past 6.30, that, that would be really great. So the next speaker is Dave Meter. Dave is a celebrated lawyer with expertise in human rights and is widely regarded as, regarded as an engaging and informative social justice practitioner. He is a published spoken word poet who's performed and led, po led poetry workshops for a range of groups. Dave is dedicated to the mission of advancing empowerment through poetry, politics and public service. He was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2000 and was a member of the legal team which brought the largest group action claim in the UK on behalf of thousands of South African asbestos miners. Dave will be speaking to us about reframing and celebrating protests and the police's negative relationship to protesters. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> thank you, Fatima, and thank you, panel. Um, my purpose, as you say, Fatima, is really to uh, promote pro to promote protests, really, uh, to elevate it as a great event and activity. I want to make a statement about protest, but first of all, I just want us to remind ourselves about what protest is. Really a statement or an action expressing disapproval or, um, or an objection of something. And as we all know, there are, there are, there are many things uh, in our society to object to and, 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 to, and to express disapproval about. Um, I also want to get into the, with this word we've been hearing a lot, uh, especially in the American context, a patriot. was a patriot, really. A patriot is a person who love their country and will do everything to try and change it to make a better place. So this is my statement on protest. I really want to, I really want to uh, uh, fix it in our minds as, 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 a, as an activity that's so important. For me, protest is the most patriotic acts of uh, people within a nation, right? I feel like it's an awesome duty uh, 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 and it's a thing of beauty. And when you think about protest, you have to ask yourself the question, when you think about the whole business of what it's talking about, about objecting to something, if you are not engaged in protest, you have to ask yourself some serious questions. And protest, we'll come to see that protest is not just about marching fist in the air, although that's part of it as well. 
But if you're not engaged in protests, then it must mean you think everything is all right. If everything is not all right, then you have to be engaged in some kind of protest. To prepare for this, I'm uh, really pleased to be invited by Garden Court to be involved in this session. And in, in, to prepare for it, I um, one of the things I did was to uh, invite a group of young lawyers to uh, uh, engage in a little bit of a focus group around protests. And what are we really talking about? And these uh, young lawyers, um, one of the things that they reflected when I was talking to them was that um, people should not look down on protest. I said, these are young men, young black men. People should not look down on protest because look at how they elevate lobbying. Uh, we should think about that. We should think about that. When you think about being a lobbyist, when you think about the profession itself, it comes with a certain tinge of prestige and so on. And so you think about these powerful people in suits going into these um, uh, 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 halls of government and power and trying to get an outcome to benefit uh, their stakeholders. And isn't that what protesters are doing? Protesters are actually identifying something that's wrong with our society, organizing, and then setting out to, to, to um, deliver a statement and action in some, in some form to bring about a better society. If anything, I would like to say at this point that the business of a protester is, is phenomenally outweighs, phenomenally outweighs the business of a lobbyist because lobbyists are interested in a small group of people making profits and protesters are interested in creating a better society. Look at how we've experienced protests in our society in the form of a march, for example. You see the fist in the ear. You see the placards. But it's more subtle than that. It can be in the form of a cake, baking a cake with the names of uh, soldiers who've been killed in a war. It can be even a leader of a nation wearing a tie that has a fish motif trying to send a message to uh, uh, people they're negotiating with about the business of fish being important to their nation. But it can also be fish itself, where people from the fisherman, fish, fishing community will want to dump uh, 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 their catch um, in front of, you know, 10 down the street, Prime Minister, to demonstrate that they have negotiated well. And this whole thing was a big error in the, in, the, in the first place. A spider, a brooch as a spider, can be an act of protest worn on the dress of a high court, of a, of a Supreme Court judge, uh, suggesting perhaps that spiders kill flies. And a good judge get rid of lies. So you see, protests can take many art form. Protests, we've seen it in art itself. Look at Chris Ophelia, the first black man to win a, a, a Turner, most prestigious art prize in this country, the Turner Prize. Look at his art. All you have to do, you can look online or you can go to the Tate Modern to see Chris Ophelia's work, No Woman No Cry. And in that piece, you'll see a woman crying. In that art piece created by Christopher, a black woman, head down cast, crying. You go close and Christopher is art is so phenomenal. You can't look at it in one blush. You have to look at it from far, from near, and you have to take it in. You go closer to that piece of art and you'll see in each teardrop of that woman crying, a picture of Stephen Lawrence. And here it is that a uh, 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 Chris Ophelia is, 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 uh, is actually creating art to be a protest of, 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 of racial justice in this country when he does that picture. Uh, protests can happen in cartoons. I've been doing cartoons now. One of them is in my backdrop here of the, of the film of the, of the protester during the Black Lives Matter uh, movement last year, black guy, Patrick Harrison, who uh, rescued the white guy, right? So in cartoons every day, there are political protests through cartoons, right? Protests can even take place in a statue. And uh, we'll come to talk about that. Let me talk about it now. The Colson statue that's been mentioned, an artist picks up on that and what does he do? An artist, Mark Quinn, 
recreates a statue of a black woman fist in the air. Her name is Jen Reed. And the whole idea was to replace the Colson audio statue of a murderer with a protester. That statue itself becoming um, a, an act of protest in its own right. And whilst we talk about that, it's so unfortunate that Monday of this week, was it Monday of this week, that the four charged with criminal damage um, at the, at the, uh, 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 for, this, uh, for pulling down the statue, charged with criminal damage. I, I'd argue that's the wrong charge. I'll come to that, but I'd argue it's the wrong charge. Because, I mean, criminal damage, right? You have to damage something. And many would argue that what they did to that statue of that murderer was actually to enhance it. Because now that statue is being talked about and used as a lesson in our nation about what we should absolutely reject. Uh, 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 enslavement and all this stuff embodied in that statue. The statue has been improved. It has been enhanced. So I don't see how they can be charged with criminal damage. But beyond that, beyond that, protests were stopped because there was a planned demonstration at the court, at the uh, Bristol Magistrate Court, and it was not permitted under the current cor coronavirus lockdown laws. Why? I mean, okay, so you don't want a lot of people. Let me remind you that a protest can be very creative. Imagine what you would see with a lone drummer, just one person, a lone drummer, by the court, or a poet, or a vocalist, or an artist, you know, maybe, uh, maybe talking about, uh, uh, maybe singing Bob Marley's song, Old Pirates, Yes, they ro ro Rabbi, that is a protest that can take place under the law. Nothing should stop, uh, should stop protests, which is, which is enshrined in the law, and it's enshrined in the human rights, uh, uh, articles of human rights, right, for us to have a protest, because it's good for a nation. My argument, it is good for a nation. It's not a distraction. It's about setting things right. And if it can't take place, understandably, with lots of people uh, who are not socially distanced and so on, then you can have it in the form of a sole individual. And so that was a missed opportunity, an equally missed opportunity in, in our nation was the leadership of our nation not taking advantage of uh, people like Brian Hall, who was in Parliament Square for the longest time. Brian Hall, now dead, uh, uh, spoke to him on several occasions, described to me how he was beaten up by the police. We'll come to the role of the police in a second. I, I want to go through this really, br really briefly. But in this period, early turn of the century, right, we have... Uh, the government being worried about the presence of Brian Hall, a protester protesting against the war with an amazing display, uh, you, know, uh, you know, talking about why we shouldn't be in this war. And isn't it right that if protest is a cornerstone of the rule of law and a nation that is a healthy nation that allows and promotes protest, that when foreign leaders come here, we shouldn't be wanting to present this pristine image of London to say we have no protesters here, but to literally point out the protest that's here. Therefore, su suggesting and showing evidence that your country is a healthy country because it promotes uh, our protest. But the opposite was done. And you all remember when they brought around the SOCPA laws, uh, 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 Serious Organized Criminal uh, Police Act 2005, designed to get rid of Brian Hall, backfired in their face because took it to court and they say, okay, you can have your law, but you cannot make it retroactive. So Brian Hall remained, right? And, and so we miss these opportunities in our country. And yet another form of protest, Brian being one, the power of the people speaking out, is, and again, we come back to artists. Mark Wallinger picking up on this replicates, replicates Brian's work put it in the Tate Britain and make sure that half of that exhibition, that art exhibition, breached the law because the SOCPA Act said that you cannot demonstrate without permission within one kilometer of, uh, of parliament. And this actual exhibition was set up in such a way that half the exhibition actually breached the law. Again, protests through art, not just marching on the street, although that too is powerful, a loud march, a silent march, just colors, just imagery, very important. So we come to the whole subject of today of mangrove. We're looking at mangrove and we're looking at BLM. 
We're looking at both of these events in our history. And they do have something in common. They do have something in common, right? Because what they have in common, which is one of the place, one of the places I want to arrive at, is this whole idea of why those protests, uh, uh, you know, what was the motivation of these protests? Okay, in the case of Mangrove, one of the placards you will see there was hands off black people, was based on the harassment of black people. Sorry, the black people being harassed by the police uh, in this country. And of course, Black Lives Matter, as it's clear, it speaks for itself. Black Lives Matter was about police brutality in America. And let us just really reimagine Black Lives Matter for a moment, because we shouldn't get it twisted about Black Lives Matter came from America or anything from here went to America. It's all the same experience. So for every George Floyd, we have a Christopher Alder. For every Breonna Taylor, we have a Joy Gardner. So it's one and the same. It's all we've all en engaged in the same uh, a process of protesting. Um, but here in particular, protests can be about a lot of things, wages, all sorts, minor strike, all kind of police brutality. But police brutality is at the heart of all of this. I want to remind us, you know, I want to remind us that the Met Police in particular was formed and established not to protect people, but to protect the odious uh, uh, and ill-gotten profits from enslavement, the sugar business. That's why it was formed. If you talk to police officers, as a regular thing, I just want to tell you folks, as a regular thing, I work with students. And one of my main jobs is to, is to bring students in contact with police officers to have conversations, to remind us that they work for us. They're not just the arm of the law. They belong to the people and ought to be working for the people. So say, have a conversation with these police officers. I have a conversation with one police officer in Westminster. You learn something every time. You learn when you work with students as well. well police officer said that our job here is not to protect people. Our job is to protect the estate, the listed buildings around here. And I feel that we need to reform that. We need to rethink that. We need to think about police being not just the arm of the state, not just protecting buildings, not just, not just working on, but, all, but we need to be transformed. We need to reform because it was badly formed in the first place. And it must be rethought. So when people are talking about defunding the police, one of the most misunderstood phrases, it's not about defunding anything. No society can exist without some kind of, of police force, but it's about reforming the police. It's about reimagining how the, how the, how the police should be uh, and about protecting the people instead of uh, working against the people. Um, uh, because the people and protests, we are, we are the most, I want, to just to, I want us for a moment to imagine a protest as a very expensive piece of consultation. All sorts of company and corporations and government bodies pay a lot of money for consultants, right? To tell them how to improve uh, management and leadership, leading and managing change within an organization, right? When people protest, they're giving it to you for free. They're telling you what is wrong with the society and where it needs to change and where it needs to, and where it needs to uh, develop. So we see at the intersection of these two big protests that we're talking about, we see at the intersection, we see, we see police right there, both parties. And it's so many years in between us and decades in between us. And the heart of it, the problematic issue is how police operate and how police behave. And we must remind ourselves, and I'm gonna close out here. We must remind of ourselves of a reggae artist, little known, not really well known, but little known reggae artist called Admiral Tibet, who sang Babylon War, right? And in the lyrics, I just, the lyrics I can remember because these things are not even online anymore, right? But I remember hearing these lyrics growing up. The war between dread and Babylon, it just can't over. Babylon police, so the war between the people and police, it just can't be over. Before them put on them, them tool and cool, we still have to remember. So before them put on them guns and the violence, really, before them put on the violence and just chill out, we still have to remember. And then a part in the lyrics said, they beat me till me unconscious, beat until I'm unconscious or dead. No Babylon, I just don't trust. So here you have the nub of the matter being sung about decades ago, still relevant today, beat until I'm unconscious, 
Babylon, Babylon, police officers I just can't trust. And at the heart of the problem, what we're looking at is a force or an agency that ought to protect and promote protests, which helps a nation ultimately is distrusted. And as one of my young uh, uh, lawyers in this focus group said, uh, and it will break your heart. It's going to break your heart. And it's going to break your heart because he talked about going to Notting Hill Carnival. He spoke about the carnival as a creation of black people. Bear in mind, the roots of carnival was, a, was, a, was, a, was a, an act of, it was an act of protest as well of enslaved Africans who, after liberating themselves from enslavement, had this carnival movement. He's going to carnival as a young black man and he's being searched. And everybody who looks like him, everybody who looks like him is also being searched. All young black men are being searched, but that's not the worst bit. That's not the worst bit is when he was going, I mean, he felt really low, spoiled his day, ruined his day. And as he's going home on the train, there's a white young lad on the train who says, I don't know why you black guys get searched all the time. Because I was there for the whole day with drugs on me and was never searched once by the police. And thus we see the inequity and the racism in our society. And the police is at the heart of it. So we must, we must continue to protest in any way that we can, whether you write poetry, you organize it, you take to the streets, or you do it in art, or you do it in song, or whatever, it is the most precious and progressive thing that we can do to bring about a society, to bring about real change. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Dave, for sharing all of that with us. Um, I'm really conscious that we've gone over, but there are so many interesting questions. So I'm going to try and finish um, for at seven o'clock. Um, someone in the chat is just saying massive claps from here. I'm sure we all um, echo echo that for, for all of the panelists, including Leslie, who was no longer able to um, be with us. Um, so I am going to I think just pick one question for each of the panelists, if that's okay. But before I do that, while most of you are still here, a shameless plug for the rest of this uh, protest series. The next part is on the 9th of February, 2021, and it looks at Sky, Spy Cops and Extinction Rebellion. There's some interesting questions in the chat um, around uh, environmental protests. So definitely one, um, one. I'm going to leave it for that, that panel to answer and please join us then. And then on the uh, 23rd of February, protesting deportations. And finally, the, the, the last in the series, protest law roundup on the 16th of March. So please keep an eye uh, on all of those. So in terms of questions, I'm going to ask Mike first. Um, there's a question by an anonymous attendee on what on what basis can the state limit the right to protest as they have done? And then the question goes on to say, as we have seen police officers give out COVID fines against legal protests, they can just use their own broad interpretation of the laws and suffer no consequence for over-policing. The police have been shown to offer limited protection during arrests and at police stations against COVID. Are there any stats on the issues? So um, I'm not expecting you to pull out stats, but perhaps if you can talk us through the rest of the question. Great. Well, um, if I miss any of those points, Fatima, you can remind me at the end. Um, on the first question about what the state can do to interfere in the right to protest. So as a matter of law, in terms of the right to protest as a reflection of the rights protected under the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to protest is qualified. And what that means is that it's open to the state to interfere with that right as long as it does so in a way which is necessary and proportionate and in accordance with the law. So in principle, you can you can do uh, what the government has done, which is pass legislation which limits the right to protest as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, or should I say the right to protest in terms of gatherings in, in the streets in the way that has happened. But the question is whether when you actually look at it on the facts of a particular case, that interference um, is, is proportionate in the circumstances. So to illustrate the point, I think most easily, what you couldn't do, I don't think anyway, properly in accordance with the law, is ban all forms of protest. 
what you can do is introduce a qualified right to protest. Now, I'm not going to offer a view at the moment about whether I think what we have um, is proportionate or not. Um, but in principle, that right exists. And of course, you can completely understand why. Um, because there is a challenge associated with, with people gathering in terms of virus transmission. So the question, as is often the case with, with a lot of um, rights protected um, in the law, is about whether or not, as I was indicating earlier, the right balance has been struck. Um, and the, the balance is certainly better struck, perhaps in the current form of the regulations than the previous form of the regulations, um, whether what we have is good enough or whether that what we have could continue indefinitely um, is perhaps a question for a different day. In terms of um, uh, the issue about officer discretion and interpretation of the law, um, the law is very widely drafted. Uh, there's lots of scope for subjective decisions about you know, what amounts to reasonable excuse potentially, or, or um, you know, lots of you know, the law and regulation of COVID as a, as a lockdown is full of areas of, of grey and discretion, and it's a problem. Um, unfortunately, as with most things, you often can't challenge it until after something has happened, and, and that, that would include challenging, a, for example, a fine after it's happened. But that, of course, presents its own problems um, because there's no um, discrete appeal process for that. Um, and the last question, the last part of that question, I've, as I thought I might, I've forgotten. So Fatima, can you just remind me what the last point was? It's the last point was about limited protection during arrest and at police station. Oh, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't have I don't have any statistic information on that. I would be surprised if that sort of information had been discreetly collected. Um, I think in principle, uh, there's an, there's a potential argument about whether engaging with a member of the public without using proper PPE um, is potentially a, a misconduct issue. Uh, and that might be the way into challenging it. Um, and I won't, in the limited time we've got, go into all of the problems about the police complaint system. Thanks, Mike. Um, again, I, I can't speak either to, to what happens at police stations, but just looking at what happens in the courts, particularly in the magistrates' courts, we're finding that most often our clients that are in the cells are not given PPE or protection or, or masks. Um, they're in small conference rooms with, um, with, with, with barristers or legal representatives. So I don't imagine it will be any better in police stations, unfortunately. Um, Dave, I'm going to come to you next. There's a question from uh, Generational Stories. Um, it's a bit of a, a, a long question, so I'm going to summarise it in the interest of time. And it's about legal representatives having to meet the bar standards, um, quite, I, I guess, um, the, the, the standards of the bar, and therefore being subject to the government's agenda to oppress, oppress black communities. Um, and I guess kind of a, a, a wider question on that is how the legal system is set up in terms of the language, the uh, opacity of the law, uh, the, the structure of the um, legal room, the, the courtroom itself. It, it, it very much is designed to decenter um, decenter defendants and, and, and decenter communities. So how can we work within the legal system to bring about change and, and, and highlight the politics of the, the issues that people are facing? Well, it's a very good question. And speaking about transformation and reform, well, I think the whole criminal justice system needs reform. And the person mentioned the court. If you walk into uh, a British court, uh, excepting for perhaps the Supreme Court, which they've given some thought, it is a very scary place. You have something, so you have somebody with absolute ultimate power dressed in a ridiculous kind of way, sitting high, already enough power and sitting high, and you're sitting low. Are you locked? If you're a witness, you're in a box. The whole thing is restrictive, it doesn't lend for the whole emotions and mind to flow and flow in a in a in, in a proper way. Uh, this is why if you really want to get uh, transformation within a person, they've worked out that in a psychological setting, you make somebody feel comfortable. You have a sofa style. Psychiatrists have a sofa. 
in South Africa, if you want an example of how we can begin to reorganize, you go to Johannesburg in South Africa and go to the highest court in the land, which is the which is the uh, which is the constitutional court in Constitutional Hill. The judge is not sitting high. The judge is sitting low. And the audience is sitting high like a lecture theater style. There are all sorts of memory built into the court and artwork and things to make people feel welcome and comfortable. But the court here is designed to make people feel uncomfortable. All right. So in terms of access to justice, it has to be all reimagined. And my central point that I tried to make in my talk is about the police officers of the law. Right. Need to reimagine their roles. It's not just about, well, you think you're going to identify with protesters, jump on a skateboard or try and dance or wind up with somebody at Carnival. It's a whole root and branch change. As some of my young uh, law students were saying, is that the whole of the police, the, the whole of the police infrastructure need to be reimagined from top to bottom, that at all levels there should be a, a, a whole uh, raft of diversity and different thinking in order to connect. Right now, the biggest problem perhaps in our country is the divide between police and the people. I have no fear of going to police because I grew up, I grew up with an attitude of dealing with police and having a conversation with police. But, but, but the history of policing in this nation, perhaps every nation, not just this nation, every nation has been one of hostility. And that has to be reimagined so that the people begin to, re to rethink and understand that the police are working for them and not against them, which all the evidence points to the police working against them. And that needs to be tackled and changed. And lawyers need to be central to that process. Thanks, Dave. Um, if a, I'm going to bring you to the question asked by Eric Anderson, who is a trainee human rights barrister. Um, and he says that he's essentially asking, how can we better combat racism in the UK by taking international action? And how effective can action in the UK be when courts are essentially institutionally racist? And I know you've been doing some work around this in the UN. So can you briefly um, answer that question, please? Yeah, yeah, I think that there's a number of different things. I think it's it's important to look at the law from a critical race theory point of view, knowing that the law is not neutral and how for our communities it has been used to and continue is, continually is used to oppress our communities. I think that's one important thing. But I think lawyers, you know, have a duty and an onus to start thinking about using the Human Rights Act creatively to hold the state to account. And if that fails, thinking about how we can take it to the European Court of Human Rights and using regional and international human rights as well. Obviously, I'm mindful that the United nations is a white institution um, with all institutions of that era but we have a duty to decolonize those institutions we have african and caribbean nations that are part of it of it now uh, and we can demand what we want i mean we all have human rights you know under the universal declaration everybody's a rights bearer and particularly when the state has um um, signed to um, human rights treaties, we become um, rights bearers to those treaties as well, particularly looking at the elimination of the Convention of um, Racial Discrimination. Um, we will note that the UK has failed to sign up to being able to make an individual complaint to that treaty body. That's no accident. So I think, you know, even within that, there are some limitations, but we can still make complaints to the Human Rights Council. We can make complaints to the Human Rights Office, something that I never really um, had a good grip on until I did the um, fellowship at the UN. And the UN is trying to encourage communities to start thinking about using international mechanisms because you can use them. And, and what's really good about the UN is there's no legal costs. And, you know, a big thing for our communities that disproportionately live in poverty is they can't access justice because they can't afford to. They can't afford to do a judicial review claim. They can't afford to, you know, take a claim under the Equality um, Act 2010 because they don't have money. So we start to start thinking about how we can, one, of course, use protests, but how we can start using international frameworks to hold the state to account. I know that in America, um, for the deaths of Mike Brown and Freddie Gray, their parents went to the UN to testify. So kind of thinking about accountability from an international scope is really important. And I want to finalise this point, particularly looking at what Malcolm X said. He said that when we start looking at our problem, not as a civil rights problem, but a human rights problem, we could take our issue to the UN. So I think, you know, particularly in the idea of reasserting our human rights as black people whose human rights have been 
denied and particularly because of slavery we've been dehumanized i think it's important to reassert our struggle as a human rights issue because racial discrimination is a human rights violation and we start using that framework against the government to hold the state to account for its ongoing um, inability or complicity to allow state agents to act with impunity but also to um, allowing system wider than the police to continue oppressing black bodies so we know even in terms of nhs black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth so complicit this complicit n- nature in which the state is turning a blind eye or you know furthering our pressure needs to stop so i think using international mechanisms is very useful and i think more lawyers need to start thinking creatively using the human rights act and thinking about international human rights law to, to defend the movement for black lives thank you Mifei. Um, I did say I'd end at seven, there's three minutes left. So Mike, I wonder if I can just come to you briefly on one more question by Sarai Baselling, which asks about um, the UK publishing details of people who have been arrested, such as age, name, street and picture, um, and how and whether that's an invasion of privacy that specifically affects communities of colour. Um, thanks. I would- answer in the three minutes or two and a half minutes we've got um the short answer is if there's a proper policing purpose um that justifies the disclosure of, of information so the the typical example might might be um somebody who is quote unquote wanted uh, and it's an attempt to to identify someone in that in that way um then that that may be uh, that may be lawful and there's some some recent case law on this um, in, in other cases, the question might be whether or not the disclosure of the information was um, proportionate for some other reason or lawful for some other reason. Uh, and I, I think there is a real issue about the ease with which um, some police forces, particularly if you look at some forces on, uh, on online, um, go about sort of highlighting people that they're interested in. Um, but in very broad terms, these are very difficult challenges. So the short answer is it depends. Um, in many cases, if there's a proper policing purpose behind it, um, then that's much more difficult. Um, if it looks gratuitous, if it's being shared um, improperly or for no good reason, then that's a very different matter. Thank you, Mike. Um, bang on time. I just wanted to thank all of the panellists one more time and, and also the marketing team who stayed with us throughout. Thank you so much. Um, and to all the attendees especially, um, thank you for, for joining us and hope to see you at the rest of, of, of this protest series. Have a nice evening.